So, hello everyone and welcome back to TFOM 2020 online interview. We have today Anthony Baldino with us today. Hello Anthony, how are you doing? Doing all right, how are you doing? Yeah, thank you, everything is fine. We are very happy to have you with us today. For um, the one who don't know uh, Anthony yet, he is a very famous sound designer who works mainly into the uh, film composing and scores. Is that correct, uh, Anthony? Yeah, that and a lot of movie trailers as well. Yeah, would you like to talk briefly about your uh, job, if it's possible, like your experience? Sure, yeah. I mean, there's so much to talk about. Um, I guess the most recent project I worked on was uh, Tenet, doing synths and sound design for that score uh, with Ludwig Gorenson, who's a good buddy of mine. Genius of a guy, gem of a human. Um, did that and also worked on the movie Venom with him, doing a ton of synths, doing some really, really abrasive synths uh, and sound design, which is a ton of fun for me. Um, yeah, and then I do a lot of movie trailer work. Um, the last big thing I did was a remix for Travis Scott uh, for Uncut Gems. Um, and then there's a bunch of library work and sound design that's also a ton of fun and keeps me busy. So this is more related to the music side of the your kind of work, right? So like yeah, to, like presets and testing and so on. Yeah, and then like you said, the other side is, is like presets for output. Um, I did a bunch of presets with Richard Devine. We were just talking about him uh, for Portal, which is an awesome, awesome granular plugin. Um, and did a bunch of work with Isotope. Um, yeah, just always happy and excited to work on cool stuff. Yeah. And like, um, want to talk about a little bit about your release that happened like almost one year ago, uh, 1222. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, how was the response of the public to the your record? You know, it was, it was a lot better than I thought it would be. Mm. <laughs> It's an uh, home song record, let me tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun making that, and um, it did get a really good response, which meant a lot to me, um, and had a lot of friends help support it. Um, and yeah, so that record was, uh, it started, it's an all modular synth record, and it, it kind of started out. The approach was going to be um, trying to do it just performance based, so like zero to no editing in the box. And so the first half was all, you know, I'd like make the craziest patch I could and then kind of um, deconstruct it uh, performance wise and, and kind of generate an arc. And that would be the, the shape of the song or track. And then um, I kind of accidentally found this very emotional patch and it just reminded me of the way i used to make music back in the day before i had um any synth any hardware synths which is all in the box and just kind of like mangling stuff and arranging it in logic and and so uh i kind of wanted to um go back a little bit to that and so yeah it, it shifted to just harvesting all of my sequences and all my drum sounds um, from my modular system and then running it back and reprocessing all of it. Uh, yeah, and then, so it's kind of, I don't know, it kind of made this like seamless mix of the two different approaches, which I was super happy about. So it's like, let's say uh, the process of this record is a bit of a live recording and plus uh post-recording, uh, so sin uh, sample mangling uh, and processing is correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I is there any other release planned for the near future? Oh, yeah. Um, I've got I've got a couple tracks in the works um, okay. so far. Uh, you know, I think like a lot of artists and musicians this year, it's been really hard to... Yeah. Uh, to sit down and write and and 
not be consumed by existential dread. Yeah, I understand. Uh, well. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's, you know, it's really interesting. Like the music I have done this year has all been leaning towards the ambient side of things. Um, just emotionally, that's all I have. The yeah. bandwidth to uh, relate to what's coming out of the speakers. And whenever I try and do these like super glitchy things, um, it's um yeah, it's like hard for me to judge whether it's good or bad or if I even like it. So a weird year for writing music, but yes, uh, release in the works. Yeah, that's good news actually. Um, if you could describe your music, how how would you describe it, uh, Anthony? Oh man, it's it's. It's really rooted in, in IDM um, with some cinematic features as well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, I guess I've always tried to keep my music um, kind of merging emotional and heavy sound design all the time. So it's, yeah, it kind of, it bridges both my world, my, like my, I don't want to say my work music because all music is, is good and fun for me um but like the cinematic side of things the emotional side and and the idm stuff you know like i when i first got into electronic music way way back in the day um super influenced by apex twin nautecker richard fine telephone tel aviv and so all that stuff's always stuck with me and been my favorite and um yeah so it's got a little bit of that old school warp records flair um and hefty records uh and some cinematic stuff <laughs> i don't know yeah. i hope that helps it's very interesting because I, i was going to ask you about this cinematic side of your music uh, um i listened also to the data cult audio event uh, and uh, was really really nice set uh, It was a oh, lot of atmospheres you. with pads and everything, and everything really seems like coming out f directly from a movie. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, compared to other, um, let's say, modular artists, uh, your kind of music is very, yeah, cinematic, as you said. So how do you find this balance between, you know, crazy glitch IDM side and this softer, let's say, cinematic side in your music? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to find a good answer for that. Um, I don't know. I guess like, I feel like the, the ambient parts and the drony cinematic stuff for me kind of, um, creates a space or a world that all the glitchy stuff can live in, you know, like, um, I'm not trying to make it background music per se, but like it gives it this, yeah, just a space to live in. And then I always tend to like, um, kind of live sample those ambient bits into my drum patches and, and, uh, make it part of the sequence. So, you know, having some glitch elements that are derived from all my harmonic content makes a really nice bridge and, and, Uh, connects those two which I try and do as much as possible yeah the, the things I find very interesting in your music is that uh, what I hear is very opposite so from one side very hard glitching and then the other side this very melodic background but all together they mix very very well and give a very nice ending to the song really it's amazing job seriously Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and wanted to ask, like, uh, in, in weird time we're living right now, uh, where do you find inspiration for your music, for example? I mean, I guess usually people tend to, I don't know, maybe having a walk in the nature might be inspiring, but right now maybe we are forced to stay in the house and not have much time to experience outside to receive uh, inspiration. Yeah. How is it for um, you right now? You know, it's funny, not, not in these, like last year and years prior, I was looking for new records and who's got the coolest, glitchiest thing coming out. Um, but during these times, I've, I've 
been so nostalgic all the time and it, it really catches me off guard so i've been reaching back for my my favorite records from like 2008 2009 um and earlier like and sometimes lose track of time <laughs> yeah like early 2000s i've been going back to all those old records and like it it puts me in this place of where i was when i first heard them and, and i guess that's where i'm trying to find inspiration from is like recreating that uh original excitement to do electronic music and, like, okay the first time yeah. i heard idm so yeah, look into the past. <laughs> Looking into the past, yeah, okay, it's, it's a good way, of course, yeah. yeah. And um, um, you were talking about before um, sampling the modular and then processing the in into the box, let's say. Yeah. Uh, would you like to talk a bit about this kind of process? How, how do you work with sample? Uh, yeah, so I, I would like make a whole bunch of drum patterns um, on my modular. And then uh, multi-track all of that into my DAW, and then kind of uh, pick and choose the best bits, and um, edit them so they like all the best parts fit together, and that kind of creates a, a foundation for the track. And then you know I'd, I'd send that back through uh, clouds or Morphogene or the ZDSP, um, and reprocess everything. So it's like making new content from existing content. So it's there's a direct correlation. So it already sounds like it's part of the same track. So just kind of doing that over and over and over again. Um, and then just cutting up, like just grabbing even like little, little pieces. Um, and then just aligning that on, on the grid and logic uh, mm -hmm. or Pro Tools and yeah, piecing it all together. Do you use also uh, many like software for um, um, how to say processing your samples? Not too much. Um, okay. Not for this record. Um, I wanted to, as much as I could try and keep it um, all from the modular. modular. As much okay. As so, but you know, I, I would do all my my mixing and um, you know rely heavily on reverbs in the box. Um, I don't know if you find this, but like. I love all the reverbs I have for live use, but for, you know, when you're making a record, you have all these tools in the computer to, to help make things sound better and, and less muddies. And uh, I don't know, just like running my whole patch through a reverb can get super muddy. Um, so I'd rely on the Eventide Black Hole and, and Ultra Reverb a lot and um, the Sound Toys Echo Boy. Uh, filter freak sometimes. Um, yeah. So so very minimal. I thought that like there was a very huge post processing in the box. Actually, everything is happening in the modular. Basically. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, not not too much in the box, processing wise, ex except for the, like basic mixing stuff. Yeah, that's nice. Very interesting. Um, like mm, talking about your system, which are the kind of modules you can't live without anthony that i can't live without yeah not, not specifically like a single module but let's say more like a type of function let's say so like oscillators or effect or whatever such a difficult question uh <laughs> for for me personally and in the last couple of years um this is going to be the lamest answer <laughs> But um, L1 has this new VCA out, their quad VCA, with an exponential switch. And like, I, my kick drums always are uh, DPO, maths, um, D DPO being shaped by maths. But these new L1 VCAs are so punchy. Um, and I'm just such a sucker for really big kick drums and kick really drums, just yeah. like, yeah, just like, oh, weighty drums. And I, I don't know why, I just I could listen to kick drums all day. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I've been really into those. And then um, 
Yeah, I really couldn't live without uh, my tip top circadian rhythms. Um, I see that one there. It's, yeah, it's like the brain for my whole system um, and helps me think compositionally and also is my main tool for performance. Yeah, so, yeah. that's interesting. When you um, perform live, how, how big is your rig, Anthony? So it's um, it's these these two middle okay. tip top two fifty two. Mm. Then I have a a custom skiff here. Um, so it's yeah, it's just two two fifty twos and and that skiff. And uh, you know, right before the pandemic, this uh, um, case in the corner. I was trying to pare down to to a single case because it's getting too much to carry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, like if if I wasn't playing somewhat locally, it was nearly impossible. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. You, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, your um, live rig. Yeah. Um, Is it like? Um, um, Sample based or is more of a traditional kind of synthesizer, so VCO, VCA filter, v and so on. It's it's fifty fifty. Um, I have, you know, my drum, my kick, and my snare are always uh, DPO, um, and then my hats will usually be like uh, braids. I think that's, and then a lot of my melodic stuff is braids. And then I have um, two morphogenes um, for doing sample-based stuff. Because I like to I like to try and do like um, new content every time to keep it exciting. But uh, I personally I do like my record, so I I want to be able to perform a a couple like live remixes of that, and that's what I use the morphogenes for. Um, and I also have the ER301, which I'll use for drums and pads. Um, and then I have a lot of effects stuff. You know, I'm using the, the chrono blob, um, delay, uh, echo phone, herb verb. Uh, sometimes I'll swap that out for the black hole ZD or black hole DSP uh, from Erica Synths. And yeah, and, and clouds is in there too. Um, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm, like, if you could have the chance to invent your own signature model, what what would it be? Oh man. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't like, not answer that one. Um, it would probably be another granular module. Granular module, okay. Uh, yeah, because I just love the granular stuff so much. Um, uh, are you into this kind of synthesis a lot, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't know, there's just so much you can do with it, and it's really gnarly sounding. Yeah, definitely. Uh, or even awesome for ambient stuff, but um, that or... I don't know. I always thought if I could, if there was a module that married the circadian rhythms and uh, make noise Renee, my my life would be made. So like a sequencer, both CD and trigger, with plenty of options and controls over the parameters. Let's say. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The like I have the uh, eloquencer which I really, really like for if I'm doing more compositional based stuff or film stuff. Um, but the tip top circadian rhythms just lets me uh, perform more. It's, it's more tactile and hands on. Yeah. Uh, and I really, really love that. And I, I wish I had uh, some CV control along with that. Um, that wasn't as deep as the Eloquencer, but can't have it all. Some, some good compromise, yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. One very last question, Anthony. If you could give any advice to people who want to start their Aerorack journey, what, what would it be? Wow. 
Um, just buy everything. <laughs> no. um, I think my advice would be whatever your first modules you get, um, don't read the manual. Just rack them up and start playing. Um, and then only until you really have to, until you're really lost, like then reach for the manual. But there's so much to be found both about um, the module itself and your own personal tastes and musical um, curiosities that you benefit without the manual. So, yes, yeah, so yeah, sometimes nice. getting lost into the, um, how to say, into the module probably is the best way to find happy, ex happy accident, right? Uh, totally. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting point of view, actually. So <laughs> you, 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 so usually when you buy something new, you tend to dive into the module, uh, play along with it, and find everything you can, and then go back to the manual if you need it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, because if I know what I'm doing ahead of time, then it's it kind of takes the magic out of it. Um, oh, okay, I understand. And then there's no like, there's nothing to explore, you know, and that's mm. I feel like that's so important using uh, modular sense is just the ability to explore and, and find new things. Mm, definitely. But yeah. like uh, with the most modern and recent module is a bit maybe more complicated this kind of approach since we have like you know a lot of menu diving or you know button combination and so on. So definitely, <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean that. I guess that advice I gave worked like six or seven years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, nowadays, like, yeah, like you're saying that the button combinations, like I, I love the morphogene, but that is one manual that I keep handy all the time. Cause like I just, yeah, so many I always have the cheat sheet on my side when I use morphogene because <laughs> yeah. it's uh... totally, yeah. Yeah, that and like the 301, um, I mean, everything. And, and like with all the new or, uh, customizable firmwares with the Qubit Nebulae, it's like, it's, it's hard to remember how everything, uh, how like the submenus and, and different modes of operation work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, Absolutely. Yeah. So this was the last question, Anthony. So thank you so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And we hope to have you with us next year, live at TF1 2021. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. Bye-bye. So bye.